Hello, and welcome into episode 68 of the Stomp the Bus Show. I am your host, Mark Harris, coming at you with Colton Dodgson. And Colton, we kind of have a choose-your-own-adventure. We could talk about ASU basketball, or we could talk about Jed Fish leaving. We're going to talk about both. Where do you want to start out with? I think at this point, people might be a little more curious about the whole Jed Fish thing. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's go, go with that. that first. And then we can get into ASU basketball. Sounds good. Well, I mean, yeah, it looks like the the uh, the school down south isn't going to be the Big 12 favorites next year, most likely, because uh, the fish man is heading up to Washington. I don't know if you know this, Colton. It's actually a little bit easier to find fish in the state of Washington than Arizona. So you don't say <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, I, I, I would have thought that he would be at, you know, Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes or somewhere. But yeah, I guess I guess that would make more <laughs> sense. Wouldn't it? Uh, that's, that's, that's what people listen to this show for. Is of course. The, the classic <laughs> No Harris brand of of quip. Of, of, of hilarity. Yeah. Yes. You'll see it on SNL in a few years. No. Uh, it's look, it, I mean, for as an ASU fan, this is a strictly from like an ASU fan standpoint, like this is amazing news. It just is. And I actually think the the uh, the coach they hired, Brent Brennan, will do a good job. Like, I think he's a good coach. I think we've seen at San Jose State that he's a good coach. Um, and he is a U of A guy. I think he worked with Dick Tomey for a bit. And I know his brother was a wide receiver on one of their teams. So, like. I think they made a good hire, but you know, it had just had Jed Fish come back, they would have been probably the favorite to win the Big Twelve this next year. And so, oh, just sure. from that alone, like that is a good thing for ASU. You know, even if even if ASU doesn't even beat U of A next year, but him leaving makes it just U of A is just not going to be as good as they would have otherwise been, and so therefore it'll be most likely easier for ASU to win next year, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That was the biggest thing um, in terms of, like, it's kind of addition by subtraction for ASU with a program that uh, it's a completely separate program. This, truthfully, I mean, has really no impact on ASU, right? I mean... Uh, no, di- no direct impact. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Makes the opponent a little weaker, which is always good. Um, the, the thing I've been kind of keeping an eye on, too, is is the transfer portal for, for U of A. There's still some pretty big dominoes left to fall, um, namely on offense. And I'm sure all of those names have, have been thrown around. Fafita, um, some, the, the wide receiver, names escaping me. But, um, yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, so, some other big guys. So, It'll be interesting to see how that all goes down, because um, if they're they're able to retain Fafita and McMillan and some of those other guys, I mean, it might not be as big of a drop off as we suspect. I mean, they're still going to probably be a pretty good team. Right? We talked about <laughs> uh, Brett Brennan and the, the job that he did at San Jose State over the last couple of seasons. Had some some pretty good years there for a program that uh, wasn't really wasn't really. Uh, enjoying great seasons before he got there so definitely somebody that can turn a program around i think the biggest plus though is you're not at the if you're looking at it as sort of like a linear trajectory right you're not necessarily about to hit your peak it felt like which is kind of where they were with jed fish you kind of have to start from square one square one uh which again really bodes well for ASU in the short term. We'll see how that works out in the long term. But I know for a long time we were talking about how ASU and, and, and U of A were kind of teams moving in an opposite direction, right? The transcendence with, with Jed Fish and, and the guys that they have there versus um, starting at square one with Kenny Dillingham and trying to build that all out. Now it levels the playing field a little bit. So we're not um, – at arm's length necessarily with, with U of A. I think it brings them back down to earth a little bit, which is, is bodes well for us. Yeah, totally. And I think it's important to, 
make it known, at least for me, that like I don't think U of A is going to be terrible next year or anything. I just no, I don't think so yeah. either. I I just think that like, and I know they haven't. There's a good chance that Noah Fafita and Tetaro and McMillan each return to U of A this next year. We don't know. I mean, they haven't entered the portal yet. Maybe they won't enter the portal. Who knows? Uh, because they have 30 days to do it after their coach leaves. So they've had like four days to to potentially do it. And I know they were at the they were at the U of A USC basketball game on Wednesday night. So like they might stay. But there's a bunch of other guys who don't, who aren't as big of names that have put their name in the portal already. So uh, this is just – this is a tweet from Max Olson on Wednesday night. Nine Arizona players have entered into the transfer portal tonight. The Athletic has learned. Here's the list. Freshman quarterback DeMond Williams. Running back Jonah Coleman. Jonah Coleman is very good. Like there's no – you don't want him to leave. Like this is like when – this is like ASU losing, you know, BJ Green and losing Conyers and losing Clark. It's like you can like it doesn't destroy your program, but you don't want them to leave, right? And wow. so the, again, that's where that the ride put John, uh, Jonah Coleman in. Uh, running back Adam Muhammad, wide receiver Audrey Harris, tight end Kean Burnett, tight end Dorian Thomas, offensive lineman Raymond Polito, who this guy was a five or a four star interior lineman who went to U of A and who like turned down other really big offers to go there. So that's a huge loss for them. Uh, defensive back Ephesians price Hawk is regarded as like their best defender, big loss. And then another defensive back, Jordan Shaw also earlier today. Um, being Thursday, Arizona cornerback Takario Davis hit the portal as well. Um, he is the second starting quarterback along with Ephesians Price Sock to leave. Uh, yeah, I mean, this guy, they were both really good players. And, like, the, the, the two starting cornerbacks from their team last year aren't as well-known as, you know, Fafita and McMillan. But this it's these types of losses that turn you into a 10-2 a and two team to maybe an 8-4 and four team. And... Not that like going eight and four at U of A, you know, on balance is like really good. But I mean, when you're expected to win the Big Twelve, like that's a huge kick in the balls. Like, <laughs> there's no other well, way around yeah. that. I mean, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we just talked about last last week too. Um, hammered home on how important depth is on any team, right? And when yeah. when you're seeing twenty guys, and I mean this this cuts both ways. I'm sure we'll see guys transfer in to play for the new coach. We're going to see guys transfer out to go play. I mean, four of the guys that you listed already have a crystal ball percentage of 100% to go to Washington, right? Like, that's going to happen. They're going to go play for Jed Fish. Makes sense. That's part of this. Um, So I'm sure guys are coming in, but you're 20 outgoing transfers. you got four incoming transfers, um, and who knows how that will work out given the new coach and everything like that. But um, losing that depth, it, you just said it. It takes you from being that team 10-2, and two, contending for uh, winning the Big 12, which means so much more now with that auto bid to a 12-team playoff, right? Absolutely. Like, we're not, we're not really talking about, oh, win the Big 12, and maybe if – an SEC team has one loss. We get lucky and get it. You're no, you're in. Like, there's no more board leaving you out if you win your conference. So, for losing, you know, losing 20 guys, it's going to hurt your depth a little bit. It, it's still a very dynamic process in terms of like, who knows who's coming in. Um, we still have to watch Fafita and McMillan, who are two very big dominoes left to fall. Um, and how they sort of gel with, with this new head coach, Brett Brennan, and, and who he brings in. But, again, I I mean, this doesn't, like, completely destroy U of A by any means. Like, let's not – nobody's saying that. Um, it just limits think, their ceiling. It limits their ceiling, and it brings them back down to earth a little bit. It levels the playing field a little bit with, with ASU, uh, at least right now. From the yeah, that's, oh, of course. Yeah. No, so, everything in college football, college sports is just – about this upcoming year, you know, because we don't know, like, everything well, can get thrown out. Like I just mean, like, today. 
because we yeah. don't we don't know who's who's leaving, who's coming in. Just you know, right. based on losing a guy they have that continuity with and, and having to start from square one with a brand new coach, obviously it's it's a big blow. So we'll see how that manifests as we progress through this off season into spring ball, into fall ball, all that stuff, um, and and go from there. But right now, brings them back down to earth, levels that playing field. Maybe won't we won't get blown out in the next territorial cup. That'll be nice. Um, yeah, and it's it. it I, I am of two minds right now because as a like just a college football fan, on one side of my brain, I'm like, this is just really shitty how this all has gone down for really i mean washington as well honestly oh like, yeah like having your coach leave after you make it to the national championship game and there's there's some rumors that he was like in talks with them even before that game kicked off too so that that adds some salt into it uh but then you but then that that you know uh, uh what's chain reaction causes it's like oh okay well you're you dub now i've now we have to hire someone and it could have this could easily be all the kansas players being mad because they hire lance leipold or they hire kansas state head coach uh climbing but they hire jed fish you know he comes up to seattle and all of a sudden like u of a football is losing players and then i'm sure it'll happen at san jose state too but the lower you get once you get past once you get down to like san jose state like I didn't even have that many fans. So anyway, but like, it's just, it just sucks how this all happens. Like it just, all of it sucks. I'm not like, it, it just from a, like, this doesn't happen when like a, a, a pro coach leaves, right? Like Pete Carroll retired, you know, DK Metcalf isn't in the, you know, transfer portal in the NFL, like Jackson Smith and Jigba is still on the Seahawks. And you could say like, it's, it, it's just all about, cause their contracts are more just, structured um and so this is all just a problem with there's not any real structure in college football and all that so i I get it from the neutral college football fan in me as an asu fan uh i didn't remember a whole lot of sympathy coming from tucson three years ago or uh, two and a half years ago i guess when all the guys left asu at spring football when ricky pearsall eric gentry uh, there's more guys. There's a lot more guys that I'm forgetting. Just Johnny Wilson, Jaden Daniels, all go in the transfer portal. I didn't. I, there wasn't a lot of sympathy in Tucson um, at that time. So, you know, it's just how it is. And I think, like, I th- well, for one, the reason him Fish leaving helps ASU. It would have helped ASU if it were Lance Leipold leaving. Or Chris Kleiman leaving from Kansas State if Mike Gundy leaves, if and when Dil- uh, Whittingham retires. Like, it's just good to have bad coaches in your league, you know? It just is. Like, a, a small portion of the Patriots' success with Belichick and Brady, not the whole portion, but probably like a 5% little uh, slice in the pie chart, is for a good 10 years, the AFC East was just had terribly ran teams and so maybe the year you go 12 and 4 you would have gotten 10 and 6 otherwise in a more competent division and all of a sudden you're not hosting a playoff game so it's all like that's why uh, i tweeted out on over this weekend from the stomp the bus account that like lose it that the big 12 losing one of fish climbing or Leipold benefits asu even in a small way because it's just one less uh good team and maybe it doesn't even benefit asu that much because maybe brett brennan will be totally fine so there's that part of it too but um i don't know that's just how i'm looking at it just from like a big picture view like i don't want you know u of a to be like i yeah so what are your kind of thoughts on it from like that perspective um i just think you know watching that all unfold i remember watching that video that came out i want to say like two weeks before jet fish ultimately left talking about how he has no interest in leaving and he has no interest in other positions. And uh, yeah. this is where he wants to be contending for big 12, whatever he said. Right. Um, and then it's like two weeks later, the biggest domino in college football falls with Saban retiring. And then obviously 
I mean, which it, the the board thing was kind of crazy because when that was all unfolding, we were talking about Dan Lanning on this show. Um, obviously, he pulls his name out of the hat. He the he flight does, tracker was wrong. Yeah, our our flight tracker intel was off, but he does the thing that like you don't see in college football, where he posts this video talking about like. The, the trendy thing to do right now is to leave, but we're going to stay and build this thing and whatever, right? He, he does that. Um, and, I mean, dude, that's the, the Alabama job. If he's turning that down, I think – I don't know who's going to be able to pry him from Oregon, right? Or maybe he, he's of the mentality, like, let's let, let's let DeBoer be the guy that follows Saban, fail, and then I'll go in and be the Alabama savior. I don't know, man. This is there's there's layers to this, but I uh, think the bigger test for landing is if and when. If I mean, who knows? Kirby Smart could be there for another ten years, fifteen years. Like he's in his like late mid forties. He's he's got plenty of time. But if like if Georgia were coming open, that's a little bit that's, different because he was there. I mean, and personally, I, mean, I think Georgia's a better job now, Ben. I think Georgia's the best job in the country. So. But anyway. probably, but again, I, I don't 10 to 15 years in college football is like an eternity. <laughs> yeah. So there might not even be conferences by then. I don't know, but, <laughs> um, or whatever, either way, I think it's, it's crazy how college football operates. And it's like, yeah, there really is no regulation on any of this stuff. Right. Like, I mean, obviously, there's the buyouts and these these institutions are making enough money to be able to pay the buyouts. And no coach is really solidified as your coach. Right. It's it's the same as kind of the players right now. And that's that's the price of success. That's kind of how it works at any level. Right. I mean, even at the pros, you, you I mean, the Eagles saw that in the worst way this season. You go you have success. Then you have to worry about your coaches being poached. And that's kind of how it works, right? That's what happened with U of A this season. They yeah. they go and they they win the uh, the that was the Alamo Bowl, right? Yep. Yeah, they go win the Alamo Bowl and then their coach is gone, and it's like that. That's the line that you walk. And the problem is, it's not just you brought up the point of like in the NFL, guys have contracts. It's two completely different things. It's apples and oranges. But in in college football, the the reality is there's no regulation on those transfers anymore right I mean you have the two undergrad transfers or whatever it is but that's not really much of a limitation when you're bringing in new guys right so or or younger guys out of high school so it's just it's the wild west right now man you never know what's going to happen on a on a year-to-year basis and you truly this jet fish thing I guess the point I'm trying to make is like you know you truly cannot trust a word anybody says after that Right. Yeah. Like the way that the, the conviction that he showed during that video, it was like, either, I mean, how was he not telling the truth in that moment? Like, it seems so convincing. I mean, maybe like the thing is that came out before DeBoer, like the Alabama job opened and the effects of that. So, like, there is a reality where he had no idea. But to say you know, I'm not interested in any job, I don't ever want to leave Arizona. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, saying like I'm happy here, things are going great, things are uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to contend. Like things that are like, yeah, I'm happy. Big. Right. Don't don't sit there and make these. And I'm sure he regrets it. I'm sure he's like, I probably shouldn't have spoken absolutes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, that's just the state of college football. It, it's Every fan needs to be worried about it, I think. Like, obviously not the, the, the perennial top 15s or whatever, but, like, ASU fans, whoever, I think it, this shows you that, like, you can't really ever trust somebody because if that one job opens that they think wasn't going to open, they're, they're turning their right. back and they're, they're hitting you with a three-minute meeting um, and then they're out the door, so. Well, so let's relate that to ASU. I mean, Kenny Dillingham is – he's Mr. The Valley. He's Mr. Act, you know, Activate the Valley. He's Mr. ASU. And I, like, I am kind of in an interesting spot with this because, like you said, like you shouldn't trust any coach. You know, you shouldn't trust him. And, like, part of being a college football coach is being able to lie. It's not all of it, but – Or at least sell, like, right? Maybe yeah. not lie, but at least sell. A lot of times that's the that's they go hand in two hand. sides yeah. of the same coin. But yeah, yeah, like sell, lie, like it's but anyway, like 
with Dillingham, like he's Mr. Arizona State. He's went here. He's from the area. It, like that's a pretty big combo. Like it's not just that he went here, but like he's not like from you know the Chicago suburbs and rooted for Michigan his whole life and then went to ASU. Like he rooted for ASU as a Valley native, went to ASU, and eventually made his way back to ASU. And so. That makes me think that, like, because not every coach leaves. You know, Mike Gundy's been at Oklahoma State forever. Cal Whittingham's been at Utah forever. Like, it's, it's, those are the exceptions, but there are exceptions. Um, It's, I don't know. It's just kind of like, I I trust Dillingham more than most, but ultimately I don't 100% trust him that if, I don't know, I don't even know what job it would be, but like, let's just say like the USC job comes open in three years. And they offer him, let's just say they offer him what Jed Fish got offered, like $8 million a year. Yeah. I don't know. I think, again, you can't, this is, Dillingham is, it's, he seems like it might be a little different. The guys that you rattled off, Gundy and Whittingham and those guys, they seem like old school guys, right? Like they were in it yeah. for the long haul. They were there to build something. You know, and and that could have factored in. I obviously I wasn't zeroed in on college football when they they were in their their first and second seasons as coaches, right? But like casual. You know, what'd you say? I said casual. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if we were paying um, attention super hard in two thousand five. Yeah, as as nine year olds, but <laughs> I wasn't really paying attention on coaches and buyouts and where they went, but. Um, I I don't really know what the state of college football was like then, you know. So maybe, yeah, that factors into it a little bit. But I agree with you. I think I trust Dillingham more than most because of that history with the area. Right. That's not so. I, in, in the case of Jed Fish, they they got him from the NFL, right? Yeah, he was, and he they the they like were in a terrible, terrible spot as a program this was at this is the coach they hired after the 70 to 7 game and and look i mean asu fans like we've won six games in the last two years so it's not like we're doing great but they were even worse than like the a either asu team you saw this past two years would have destroyed where u of a was at that point like that was a that was that was down like it's the worst that's like the worst you'll ever see a power five team be you know so it's they, they just needed to find someone, you know, and so ultimately, if you told an a, a U of A fan like at the time, like, hey, like your program's going to be completely turned around, you're going to win ten games, and and three of the lo- three of your or two of your three losses were in overtime too, so like you were you were a good team, you didn't like luck into ten games. If anything, you were kind of unlucky to only win ten games, but this guy's going to leave. Like, eh, like I, I don't want him to leave, but ultimately the pro like one thing that is absolutely true is that U of A football is in a much better place now than they were pre Jed Fish, even with guys transferring out right now. You know, a hundred percent. And I mean, dude, you sign up for that every every time, right? Yeah. If somebody says you're going to win ten games and win the Alamo Bowl, and and almost right, you, you your losses are in overtime, so those are like thriller games too, like. You, obviously it sucks to lose a coach, but you sign up for that, right? Especially when, I mean, U of A and ASU have both been down really bad. Obviously, U yeah. of A was in a terrible spot. We were in an awful spot this year. So, yeah. it, it's, I mean, if you were to tell me, yeah, we're going to get to 10 wins in two seasons, but Dillingham leaves the next season, it's like, okay, then we're going to be in a much better spot and maybe we're going to be able to bring somebody else in who can – who can take it over. And that's got to be what U of A is thinking right now with, with Brent Brennan. So uh, I think you sign up for that every time. See, I don't, uh, that's tough as an ASU. I think with Dillingham saying so much, I mean, he's been Mr. ASU from day one, like probably even before he got like pre day negative one, honestly. But he's also like been very enthusiastic about it too. Like, it's not that like, he's just like, Oh, this place is awesome. I want to be here. Like he's, he goes the extra step in his comments. And so 
because of all that, I don't think I would sign up for if it would be this this upcoming year, you kind of return to middling and then in 2025, you win 10 plus games and he leaves. I don't know if I would sign up for that just just because if Dillingham left in three years, I, I, I would consider like, dude, like, why are you why are you going on so much stuff about the Valley and all this? Like if you're if you're going to leave in th- three that's just my thing i just I meant would, however like, sign up for, i just meant like a hypothetical right like maybe using dillingham's name was kind of confusing but like if you're going to get a coach who's going to come in because i think you're absolutely right dillingham's yeah. sort of passion and everything that he's shown would make that a hundred percent worse but if you're going with just some hypothetical coach kind of like who jed fish was right if we're putting ourselves in i see, I see in what you're saying. yeah that's all i meant because you're a hundred percent right like a guy like Dillingham leaving after three years after how hard he's sort of like dug his feet in the sand, so to speak, would be like, think okay, so. you know. right. It would be like, okay, you truly can't trust anybody because I feel like we're both in agreement. Dillingham is kind of the exception to the rule in that regard for us based on what he's shown so far. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we think anyway. You know. Yeah, exactly. And, that, all yeah. you can do is is go off of what somebody's telling you, um, right? And what we're hearing. So, I mean, he he seems like this kind of seems like this was the ultimate goal from the jump was to be at ASU. Yeah, totally. So, and the other thing is, I would. So, I was looking this up today. Dillingham's contract when he signed it in uh, December of twenty twenty two. Five-year contract ends on November 27th, 2027. So end of the 2027 regular season. Base salary of $3.85 million with 100000 annual increases. So by the end of that deal, he'll probably be making like $5 bucks a year. And that's just before any sort of bonus. Um, he also, remember he had a clause in his contract that he has a... Uh, if it was a reduction of scholarship of four or more players or a bull ban, which obviously is um, from Herm Edwards, uh, this clause or it's a, an addendum uh, triggers an ASU extension for each year the sanctions are in effect. So he really has one, he's his uh, contract really goes through 2028 now because of the bull ban last year. So what I would say Are those is self-imposed sanctions too. Would that count if it's like self-imposed? I think so. Okay. Because that was self-imposed. I think because I remember it was reported at the time that he got an extra extension, an extra year because of that. Um, okay. And the reason I bring all this up is actually uh, twofold. One, I would what I would sign up for with Dillingham is for him to either finish his contract or make it six years. I would sign up for six years, and then if he leaves after six years, the program, if he's leaving, that probably means the program has at least, like, just established itself within, like, the high school recruiting community more and just has had, I don't know, probably a few good seasons. Like, you've probably just kind of built up the base of the program more so. Uh, So that would be part of it. And it's six years. Like, a lot of – if you could look through Wikipedia, like – most of I think Todd Graham lasted exactly six years. And by the end, he was getting pushed out. You know, uh, you know, Erickson didn't last six years. Herm Edwards in that the last six years. I don't. Maybe Dirk Cutter did. Um, but it's it's not like every coach lasts six years. So I would take Dillingham's full contract and then see what happens after that. You know, uh, and the other thing, the reason I bring that up is. I don't think ASU is going to have some huge, like, budgeting mishap that causes them to lose two hundred forty million dollars, like U of A did. And yeah, that's, I'm sorry, that's like awful. that absolutely factored into him not getting like an extension or whatever. Like, I don't have any. I'm not. I'm not sourced in this at all. But like, the idea that just the university's missing two hundred forty million dollars and things are going to have to be cut, like. To believe that that had zero impact on him, because he wasn't making that much money. I think Dillingham makes like made like a million dollars 
I think Dillingham's current contract was like a, at least a million dollars more per year than Fish's was at U of A. So I don't think ASU is going to have that type of like financial when, problem to that when, level. How long was Jed Fish's contract with U of A? Do I don't you know. know. Uh, let me let's see if I can find that. Look that stuff up on the fly. Because You're right. If he's in the last year, okay, a person familiar Fish had agreed to a seven-year contract. Oh, wait, no, this is for Washington. That's my Washington. bad. Yeah. Um, report Arizona Fish have agreed. So this says agree in principle on restructured contract five days before. Oh, so the university have an agreement in principle on a restructured contract with a boost in pay, but it has to be approved by the Arizona Board of Regents. And then, yeah, he was gone. That was on January 13th. He was gone, like. Has to be approved uh, by the Board of Regents. I don't, yeah. Yeah, that's that's crazy. But anyway, um, yeah, they, they tried. Okay, so it looks like they tried to update his deal with the interest coming in, right? So they were trying to, like, mm. entice him to stay. And it just never happened. But anyway, I mean, it seems like that might have been a little too little too late, right? It's like right. that was that was reactionary versus like, let's do this now, trying to get ahead of it and being proactive about the fact like, hey, we just won the, the Alamo Bowl. We just beat Oklahoma. We finished as a top 15 team. We were nowhere near that three years ago when this guy got here. Let's sort of read the tea leaves a little bit, recognize the fact that with – the uncertainty of college football, this guy might get poached, right? So, like, yeah, I don't know. They, they might have – they should have been a little more proactive about that maybe. But, again, it's – there's blame to go around, I think. But Yeah, whatever. I mean, some of it's just circumstance. Yeah. And the, just yeah. the individual as well. Like, some people want to leave more than others, and, you know, that's just how it is. And so yeah. – uh, But either yeah, way, well, yeah. Hopefully, ASU picks up, like – I don't know how much more guys they're going to portal in just because they've added so many guys. But 22. I don't know. Hopefully they pick up, you know, a guy. There's four schools open right now. There's Alabama, U of A, Washington, and I guess San Jose State. So hopefully add a player or two. Maybe someone who wants to come back to Arizona. I don't know. Um, so we'll see. I mean, UW had some Arizona guys on their team. I'm sure. I, I think they're centers from Arizona. So. Well, what just happened, too, is uh, Noah Brown from the, the alma mater, Centennial, uh, decommitted from Washington. He's Noah a Carter. Noah Carter. Why didn't I say Noah yeah. Brown? I was looking at our, our – uh, I, I, I was looking at Rayleigh Brown. I was going through our transfers, and I just took his last name and put it with Noah Carter. But anyway, Noah Carter from, from the alma mater, man. Four star guy, I guess he tore up one of those those high school games. Uh, he's visiting Alabama. Well, one of those high school like all school. We're recruiting him at Washington. Just he, you know, probably thought he was good enough to go go to Alabama. I guess so. Right, but who knows, man? Maybe that's something that they'll try to jump in on. He reopened his recruitment, so that was, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure Dillingham has. I'm sure yeah. Dillingham has. But if you're this is where, like, the, the whole local recruiting thing, like, I, I think people need to fine-tune their arguments a little more, I guess, is, like, you should be recruiting Noah Carter 100%, but he went he, – he was he was at UW beforehand, and now he's getting offered by Alabama. So, like, oh, yeah. It looks like well, Alabama – You can only do so much as, as a – Yeah, as yeah. A it looks like Alabama's crystal balls at 100%. So, yeah. we might have we missed on that one a little bit. But I, either but way – I, I like the idea of trying, though. You, you have to try. Yeah, I mean, but that's what we were talking about with the, the, um, the fallout of these decisions, right, is you never know when a, when a local kid is committed to one of those programs and, uh, and you, can, you can at least – because who yeah. knows, man, with this transfer portal era, we've talked about that a ton. He's there for a year. It doesn't work out. Well, I guess 
you know, he wants to play for Kalen DeBoer. That's obvious. I didn't even put two and two together. Yeah, that that's why I brought it up. Yeah, that's why it makes a lot of sense. But anyway, um, maybe he gets there, wants to come home, whatever. That happens sometimes. Oh, yeah. Guy, oh, yeah. As far as Alabama, that's not – I mean, Washington's not particularly close either, but it's closer than Alabama. So, right. um, who knows, man? Just stay in his ear. Wish him the best. Maybe he has fond memories of his conversations with you after a year and comes totally. home. Yeah. Well, I mean, and we've had Prince Dorba this past year from Texas had like six sacks. Clayton Smith looked good in his time when he played. He was from Arizona, you know, I mean, uh, Oklahoma. So, like, this is having guys from like legitimate, like top 10 type schools transfer down to ASU. That I'm signing up for. Like, I think that is a good bet to make. And you're not going to hit all of them. Some of them are transferring down for a reason. But, okay, maybe, like, like I'm okay with the, someone getting beat out by, like, a future, like, second-round NFL pick and then coming to ASU, you know? <laughs> like, that's where we're at. Like, we need to accept where we're at. Like, this is why uh, – I can't just like 100% believe dealing him. Like I really want to, but I like, you just can't, you know? And um, yeah, I guess that's it. But Hey, for once for in what seems like two years, the football karma is heading north to Tempe. Yeah. Finally. Now, the pendulum, the now, pendulum has started to swing back a little bit. It's been a while. Yeah. True. Well, uh, the basketball karma is not in Tempe, not in a good way. Uh, <laughs> and when I'm talking about men's and women's basketball, I haven't been paying too much attention to women's basketball, but they haven't been good. So I think they've, they've been really bad. But men's basketball, how much of the game against UCLA did you take in, Colton? Um, so, you know, it was one of those things where I may have, have woken up from my – uh, my post work nap and then started like, I don't know, making dinner or something and like kept an eye on the score and saw that it was kind of a blowout. And I was like, oh, okay, nice. Uh, and then in true ASU fashion, I saw that the score was, was way tighter than it was initially. Um, and I, I watched a, the better part of the la the second half. So I saw the, the Celebunge technical foul, which was that is the only good. technical that like I actually agree with. Um, well, yeah, no, that one that one made sense. He like got in the guy. I get it, yeah. but I mean, all I'm saying in that situation, you got to be you got to be smarter because that's that's four shots. Uh, I think they only ended up making two, but uh, still, that that gave them a two point lead. Um, but yeah, I know that Sean Phillips was ejected. Uh, four technicals in the second half, right? Five yeah. total. I I believe so. I'll look at the box score again. And I mean, it, you lose by three points, man. Like, yeah, or two points. No, it's it's tough. I I want to blame the ref. Like the thing is, like. If th I'm saying this, but this isn't really like the theme of how I feel, if that makes sense. Like, if they had just gotten like neutral ish refereeing, they win the game because there wouldn't have been that many technical fouls. And ASU would have kind of just, instead of blowing the second half lead, they would have just kind of held on to its second half lead. But that said, this was a winnable game. For ASU, like winnable, like it, like it was weird. I was watching the game with my our friend Matthew Tonus, and I looked at him, and like probably like eight minutes left to go in the first half. I'm like, ASU is just a better, t like has better players, like, and I don't like. I agree, like I don't, I don't change that opinion. It's just, oh, this team would just be disjointed so quickly, like. Every time yeah. they have a big lead, I'm like, okay, like this is good. We have a lead because I know that we're not going to – like if we end up winning by double digits, it won't just be because we held on just 
steadily was up by double digits the whole time. It'll be because a 11 point lead turns into a three point lead. And then you go on a run again, you're up by 12 and then, you know, like whatever, or that you lose the lead. Like you did on Wednesday night against UCLA, a bad UCLA team too. That's, that's, yeah. That's the worst part, man, is that's, that's not a good team. Um, No, you know, you, you, you have everything go the way that it went. Um, in terms of like the technical fouls and obviously it's emotional. And I, I did like what I saw from Frankie Collins after the Cella Bungay. He's good, foul. man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I he, agree with he that. Blossomed into an insanely talented player or an insanely um, effective player for this team. Yeah. Efficient player. Anything you effective, want to do, yeah. he has become like the guy for this team. And I thought, his leadership after the Celebunge technical foul was like, okay, he is he is the alpha dog on this team, right? He is the yeah. he is the leader, and he was kind of coaching Celebunge up in terms of like, do not lose your composure like that, like it's gonna hurt us. And you know, a lot of times it's just like guys guys don't really get involved like that. So to see that from him was like, okay. They do have that leadership. That's good. I think what sings the most about this, obviously, when you're looking at the standings, they're still four and two in the Pac-12. Dude, I don't care like, about this. Like, yeah, I, yeah, they're still second. But once you look at like who they still have to play, it's I don't know. Like that. That's one that you had to win because of the state of who you were playing. Right. So it, well, it hurts. What sucks? It hurts. Yeah, and what sucks is. You shoot 40% from three. Yeah. And you move like incredible three point shooting night. That really hurts, man, because you're probably not like, sure, you're going to get a few more games like that, but you're not going to like 40% is tough to reach again. Like, especially from what we've seen from this team, like having Adam Miller helps for sure. And Adam Miller is very good. Um, Yeah. Him, I mean, him being back on the floor, like, that does make a difference. And Phillips as well. But, yeah, it's just, like, with this team, it's – they're clearly better than the last – or the two episodes ago when we spoke back in, like, December. And they're just getting destroyed, just blow, just gross, embarrassing blowout losses. Uh, I mean, after that – Northwestern game. It was just awful, and the TCU game was bad, and the two other uh, BYU and Mississippi State were bad. It's, it's just like you're just like spiraling. Like, what? How bad could this get? And in, I would say, in the entirety of Pac-12 play, even including this two-game losing streak, it's you look at the team, and you're like, okay, like this looks. This is a functioning team. Like they, you can see like how they can match with other good teams. They can score. They have multiple guys who can shoot. They may not be, you know, hot that day or anything, but like there are guys, there are multiple scoring options. All this, um, but it's just like e- even in. Sorry, uh, some random ad came on. Um, but even in like the span of good play that they've had, you still see just the like the lack of cohesiveness at times and just like, I don't know, just undisciplined undisciplined play that you still see. Um, and you saw it in the Bay Area series too, but you, it reared its ugly head last night to a bad yeah. UCLA team. It's That's, one of those things where like, it's so hard. Playing sports is so emotionally charged and competitive and all of those things and when you have to like when you feel like you're not only battling the people you're playing but you you feel that you aren't being officiated fairly i think it's really hard to keep those emotions that is true right when you feel like this it, it should not be going this way if this was an objective uh officiating job right and obviously who knows where the officials stand, whatever. Who knows well, what the reality the guy, is? Like, apparently the guy who did it has, like, a history with ASU. And so, like, his name's Tony Padilla. And, like, 
they try not to have him do ASU games that often. And it's like, of course, like, of course that exists. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, it's so hard to like go through that. Like, I just know if I was, dude, I used to do that in intramural basketball. Like, I get I get teed up in intramurals all the time for talking shit to refs. Like I I get it, um, but oh man, it's it's and I feel like when you have a guy as charged up as Bobby Hurley is all the time, you know he's gonna go to bat for you. You know he's gonna go to war. He's getting texts himself. Like I don't know. Sometimes that can that can be tough too. And the, ASU isn't built to like I guess mentally and emotionally built to withstand what they had to deal with last night from the officials they're yeah, just really. not going to be able they're okay. just not going to be able to let that slide or maybe this is a teachable moment for them but i i don't see a team coached by bobby hurley necessarily being able to tune that out when they feel it's affecting the outcome of a game yeah and they, like i've defended hurley on the show i think that you know whatever it's ASU basketball you kind of have to live with some like the the alternative is likely worse um but it's when you're always arguing with the officials and he was on it early in the game like within the first three minutes and it wasn't even something something was something minor and it's like when that's that's when you set the tone of that early in the game on a frequent, you know, basis, then like human nature kicks in with the refs and maybe they're going to call, like, they're just going to not going to make as many calls or whatever. Like they're, they're going to screw you intentionally or subconsciously. Right. And I mean, there, uh, Adam Miller shared on his Instagram, one of him going up for a layup and the guy just hitting his arm and they just didn't call it. I think it's Adam Bona too. Yeah, and he's he was good. Although yeah. I don't, he's not like offensively great, but he can defend for sure. No, but I'm saying that's who I think hit his arm, which right. would have been his fifth foul, I think, too. Yep. So obviously that missing that's that is big, but um, that's why we need robot officials. So. Yeah, I don't know how I don't know how well you can I don't <laughs> robot officials for college basketball. Yeah, I feel like that would. That would be like bad. Where, have you seen the episode of South Park when they go trick or treating and they have Cartman on the iPad? Um, maybe once, but okay, not. So we do that. We do that with an AI ref, <laughs> and that's how we solve this problem. We take the human element out of it completely. Um, Bobby Hurley's just like screaming at a robot yeah, with his hands behind the, his back. Pushes the yeah head butts the iPad. I love. I love how he always has his hand behind his hands behind his back. I feel like it's like a mechanism to be like, I'm just gonna yell at you, and you know that I'm not actually gonna hit you because yeah. my my hands are behind my back. So like, I'm going out of my way to show you that like, hey, I'm just gonna yell at you, but I'm really gonna yell at you. Yeah, it's it's, it's like so- a it's like diffusing the threat. Sort of, uh, but he's yeah. always at like a forty-five degree angle too. Like, dude, he looks like a bird. He looks like a pecking bird. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how he does that with the the iPad refs, but he'll find a way. Yeah, it's it's tough. And the Washington game last week, like, oh yeah, that I don't know with that one. Like, I didn't feel as bad about that one because you you played a good game for most of it, and then like. They just they just got that uh, severe Wheeler hit like five threes. He made all five. I, I'm pulling up the box score right now. I think um, Keon Brooks had a great game too. Yeah, that, that game. One, was I, that close. one, like, I'm not saying like that game was close until like the 10 mi- minute mark in the second half. Yeah, UW awesome. UW awesome. shot 52 percent from three. Some of that's some of that's like defensive issues, but a lot of that's just guys hitting threes, like fifty-two yeah, percent. And they had they had three guys. No, they had uh, three guys with four or more threes. Or that's not true. 
Wheeler hit five of five, Keon Brooks hit three of four, and then uh, Moses Wood four of ten. So they got uh, – I can't do math right now. Uh, Twelve combined threes from three guys. But, like, that's crazy. ASU had a – what did they shoot last night? Like 45%? Something like 40, that? 40. 40. Not Still. 52. They – no, that's that's you're not beating that. If somebody's shooting fifty two percent from three, you're you're not gonna win that game unless you're also shooting like forty eight or whatever it is. But I mean, anytime, even like ASU with with how streaky we can we've seen them be sometimes, wasting a forty percent night from three against an inferior UCLA team yeah. because you can't keep your emotions in check. Like, the one for me that was like, okay, they're not going to win this game was the the Celebunge one. I mentioned no, that. No, that me too. But that, that was, was where it's like, okay. That was they, the first attack, yeah. Yeah. No, that's where you're like, okay, they are – they're not able to withstand this right now. It is in their heads. Um, So, it's a bummer. I mean, they had a razor-thin margin for error coming into non-con. We knew that. Or uh, conference play, I mean, uh, we knew that after the non-con slate and, and what they what they did in that uh, in those games. But I mean, that razor thin margin for error was factoring in they'll probably beat the teams that they, well at the very least they would need to beat the teams that they should beat, and they just dropped the ball on that one last night. So I don't know, man. It's shaping up to be like. <laughs> Make a miracle run in the Pac-12 tournament, or there's going to be no, no tournament. Honestly, I had this thought earlier today. It's shaping up to be like every, like most other, like good ASU seasons. You just don't have any good wins in the non-con to help to build up your resume. Right. That's what kills you. That's and that's why the non-con remains important. Because of how bad they did, and you have no margin for error. And you, if you're, you know, Bobby Hurley fan, Bobby Hurley hater, just an ASU basketball fan, like you know that once you get into Pac-12 play, it's not just going to be like come out of there with like three losses or something. <laughs> like that's not happening. So, yeah. And a part of me is kind of happy that they, I don't know, like happy that they just didn't do well in the non-con because now like I can just kind of enjoy the rest of the season without having to be like, Oh, we need to make the tournament. We need to make the tournament. It's like, dude, we're not making like, it would take so much to go right for us to make the tournament. And we would probably, yeah, it's just, it would, it's kind of the pack the ball. question. Yeah. Win the pack exactly. tournament. That's, that's your route. If not, we're, we're tailgating some NIL games. And I, NIT. Why do, I always do, I always do the NIL tournament. Uh, yeah, the NIT. We're tailgating some NIT games. Dude, I, I – if they get – yeah, no, we talked about this last week. If they give us, like, a good run in the NIT, I don't know. I'm not going to be, like – that's still not great because, like, I'd rather obviously make the tournament. But it's, like, I don't know. With this team, like I, I can see the talent. I, mean, I don't think that like it's a, they're just terrible, but they just have enough flaws and have not taken advantage of enough opportunities to the point where it's just like, okay, like you guys will hopefully win. I don't know what 19, 18 games, and that's not going to be enough to get in the dancing double tournament, and. Could have been worse. Could have been better. I don't know. You know, but I don't know. That's just kind of how I feel. Like I wasn't as upset leaving the game last night as I should have been, if that makes sense. Yeah, because I feel like it kind of felt like a long shot going in. You know. Yeah. Like it doesn't. Yeah. It didn't necessarily feel like they fumbled. Like oh no, they had such great chances going into this game, and now this is going to break them. Their chances were were bleak going into the game, you know? Like, so maybe that's why it was kind of like 
you need a miracle run. You needed a miracle run when conference play started to even have a shot. So like, right. it doesn't really it, – there. it's really, like, inconsequential, it feels like. It's a terrible loss, but in terms of the outlook for the rest of the season, it, it all things considered, it really is inconsequential. Yeah. No, it probably would have made me more upset. No, I mean, not probably. It would have made me more upset if ASU had beaten – let's just say they beat – TCU and BYU. There you go. And they lose to Northwestern and uh, Mississippi State. But they would be 12 like and five. 5 right now, even, even with the 4-2 and Pac-12 record. I would probably be more upset about losing to UCLA in that scenario because it's like, no, you're actually messing something up. Like, right. The, like this is like ah you're kind of messing something up it's like it's like dragging in snow into like a college a house where a bunch of college guys living in it's not clean anyway it's like ah you're drug, drugging some snow from outside but there's a you know half-eaten pizza on the table and the floors are sticky from you know parties that haven't been cleaned up after you know it's like yeah you brought some snow in but like Anyway, losing to UCLA as a good team, it's like, oh, like you messed up, but like that's gonna hurt you down the road, you know? Right, so, like you fumbled anyway. it. Yeah. Well, USC is not good either. They are uh, eight and ten, two and five in conference, second worst team in the conference based on that. They won't have Isaiah Collier for Saturday's game. ASU should win. They should. But I don't know. I am I am prepared for either outcome. Yeah. Let's see. Knowing that going in, we are the better team. Yeah, I mean that's that's what we had last night too. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, at least at least you get to watch some Brawny, right? I'm kind of excited to see Brawny. I won't lie. Yeah. I'll probably just end up watching that one because it's on Fox. I'll just end up watching that one at home. But yeah, dude, I'm, I I like that it's at noon because I can just watch it and then watch the two divisional games on Sunday. Oh, is that Sunday or on Saturday? On Saturday, yeah, there we go. I was like, is that game Sunday? Yeah. Um. Yeah, man, it'll be nice to have that. They they always play so late. It's annoying. I like those mid afternoon right. games, and they're so rare. So. Yeah, I know. It's yeah, it'll be cool just to kind of, yeah, just kind of get it out of the way. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll know early. <laughs> um, get yeah, it out I, of the way. God. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to watch divisional games, man. Oh, that's I funny. like. I need to take a break from from football. It it took years off of my life the last month and a half, so. I don't know if I'm going to miss it. To. This is the best football weekend of the year. Are yeah. You? I'll probably end up turning it on. I My thing is I am just terrified that the Niners are going to do it. And I I that would just be the straw that broke the camel's back for me in a terrible football yeah. season. They – I don't know. The NFC, like – I have a hard time imagining the winner of the Buccaneers Lions game going to San Francisco and winning. And I really it's gonna be hard for me. I really don't think the Packers are gonna win either. But the Dude, Packers did I look will, awesome in the last I game. will say this Jordan Love looked fantastic. Whatever they're running on offense, whatever scheme they're running, it's working. You can I think the Niners front seven is their strength, right? So if you can scheme up to be able to throw on them, Jordan Love can make the throws. Who knows, man? Yeah. I think they're more I think they're more built for an upset than people think. Maybe that's, that's just my absolute hatred of the Niners speaking, but um, I don't know, man. I'm holding out hope because if I have to see a Niners or a Chiefs title, then it's just I don't know how I'll come back from that. I might retire for good. Well, you got to be rooting for the other bird team in the playoffs, then the Ravens. Yeah, I would. I would like to see the Ravens get it. That would be. They nice. are the biggest 
roadblock to either of those teams. Yeah, I I wouldn't mind a Ravens title. I mean, obviously, my my number one. I want to see the Bills do it. They deserve it. Bills or Lions. Bills or Lions winning it. I, I'm good with that. But Niners. Watch like the Bucking, Buccaneers versus Texans or something. It'll probably just be Niners versus Ravens. Uh, yeah. I mean, if that's the case, they need to look at going back to two buys because the last two Super Bowls have just been chalk throughout. And it's like, cause one team, I think that rest disparity makes such a huge. Yeah. Impact. I, I like the two buys better. No they one was did. asking to change that. The only That's reason the they did is because of the, the COVID year. And they just, because teams were having games canceled and stuff or postponed. Well, yeah. They but if they, they would have changed it back though. If they, but that's like, what I'm saying. The only reason they changed it to begin with is because of that wonky schedule. Well, right? Maybe they just use that as an excuse. It could very well could be. The NFL is trying to, you know, now they get the super wild card weekend and all that stuff. They have more games. So, yeah. Um, I would, I, two buys would be awesome, but whatever. It's a nice well, little piece here. College football playoffs going to have four buys out of eight teams. So, there you go. Out of twelve teams, and those are those. Would those just be the the strongest four conference winners? I think so. I don't know. I do not know. Um, probably we could look that up. College football. Team structure. This is great. Great content right here. Yeah, I don't know who's still around at this point in the show. So All right, let's... USA Today. Uh, da, da. The new 12-team college football playoff will include the six highest-ranked conference champions. That'll be changed to five. They get automatic bids. Um, okay, so I think that – I think if, like, the Big 12 winner goes, like, nine and three or something, I, I don't think that they're guaranteed a top-four spot. Is I think that's the way. I think it's just – the top four teams get buys, and but every conference champion is guaranteed to get in. So that's probably that the same thing. Do it. Explain it. Hopefully this ends up mattering for ASU at some point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could, man. Sooner rather than later. We'll see. It could. It could. TCU was in the national championship game last year. Arizona just won 10 games, so things happen. Exactly. All right. Uh, hockey, they lost both games this weekend to Cornell. One of them came in overtime, so I guess that may go down as a tie. Dropped to 16 in the USCHO poll. So not a great weekend for them, but – they got to just keep winning because they. I think they're just playing all these like teams that are like not very good teams, and so they. It's kind of like ASU in the Pac-12 with basketball, like you just got to beef up on these bad teams, and it's just you just need to avoid losing to them more so than beating them. But that's where they're at, and this is weird. Like, I don't know. I saw Ralph Amsden bring this up the other day on Twitter, or X, as it's known technically uh there's been nothing no word about an ad search like, oh for ASU. yeah it's been like two months now since ray anderson has uh switched roles within the university and there's no way like there's not even any rumors and like in like this past week ohio state hired texas a&m ad ross bjork they did it within like a two day span. And it's like, like, why, why is this going on? You know, I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. That seems, that seems strange that they haven't gotten the ball rolling on that, but I don't know, man. Michael Crow is a different way of operating. So we'll see. Yeah. That's, oh God. Yeah. It would be he's so just smarter. He's just it would smarter. Be so than great if, like, the Arizona Board of Regents said, like, hey, Mike, we're going to overrule you here. You are not making a choice for athletic director. We'll pick someone who, like, isn't, like, doesn't have huge red flags or anything like that. Like, I get it from that perspective. But 
just I wish he wasn't involved in it because I just feel like. So would that mean that Gene Boyd right now is like, oh wait, never mind. Doctor James Run into it's run. Yes, I'm gonna run. Yeah. Okay. I, I, think, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much you like. I have no idea what like the role of like an interim athletic director is, but I feel like it's probably just a lot of just like natural job tasks that are were always there. I don't know, like a lot of emails and just a lot of just general stuff. I don't think it's like you're making a new hire for anything, you know? Yeah. So he is currently the senior vice president for educational outreach and student services. And he's an associate professor at Mary Lou Polson. Um, and I guess he is currently the athletic director for ASU. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the the responsibilities look like for an interim AD. Um, but I, I just run the day to day. I guess I don't know. Maybe yeah. He's, yeah. Maybe they're comfortable with what he's doing right now. I, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. I just. I, I, it w I would like some clarity on that because I feel like having a well, strong I can, I, can just, I can just text Michael Crow and ask him if, if, hey, that's, Mike. All need, if that's all you need is clarity. You should have just asked, dude. I would have been happy to text him. Yeah. All right. Got anything to add, Colton? No, I'm good. I think we covered it. Yeah. I feel like – I feel like we did. So uh, have fun with Coach Brent Brennan, U of A fans. And I, <laughs> I'm i talking shit, but like we're, we could still easily lose that next year too. That's the sad thing. Yeah, so, I don't know. Maybe he'll be good. We'll see. We'll see. What a, what a great enthusiastic tone that we have. But all right. As time. always, thank you for listening.